I know the one thing we did right hey! was the day we started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. The change began slowly, especially in rural areas. Blacks knew they could still lose their livelihood or their lives if they pushed whites too fast. But step by step, the change began, first with small acts of personal courage. In September 1955, an old man named Mose Wright took that remarkable first step. His story starts at the Tallahatchie River in Money, Mississippi. Here, the body of Mose Wright's nephew, Emmett Till, was found, weighed down in the waters. Two local men were arrested and charged with the murder. They were white. Emmett Till was black. Till had come down from Chicago to visit his relatives. This is Mose Wright. I am the uncle of Emmett Lewis Till. Sunday morning, about 2.30, someone called at the door. And I said, who is it? And he said, this is Mr. Bright. I want to talk with you and the boy. And when I opened the door, there was a man standing with a pistol in, in one hand and a flashlight in the other hand. And he asked me, did I have two boys there from Chicago? I told him I have. And he said, I want it. I want the boy that done all that talk and then marched him to the car, and they asked someone there, was this is the right boy? And the answer was, here. And they drove toward money. And I found out about it 9.30 Sunday morning. I was in bed. I got up, called my mother, when I got the news, because I had, every decision I had ever made or every crack that I had ever been in, it took her to get me out of it. And I took that one to Mama, too, because I didn't know what to do. Mother told me to come right over, and she would start making calls. And I got over there as quickly as I could make it. And that wasn't very long. By this time, everyone in money knew what had happened. Emmett Till had broken one of segregation's rules. He talked fresh to a white woman in a store. He was only 14, he was a northerner, and he didn't understand. He went into the store, uh, to buy some candy. Before we went in, he had showed the boys around his age. He had some picture of some white kids that he had graduated from. That was, you know, female and male. So he told the boys down there, you know, hey, you got around this store? This one must have been around about maybe 10 to 12, you know, youngsters around there. That the girls was his girlfriend, you know. So one of the, the local boys said, hey, there's a girl in that store there. So I bet you want to go in there and talk to her, you know. So he went in there to, you know, get some candy. So when he was leaving out the store, after buying the candy, he told us, say, bye, baby. And the next thing I know, one of the boys came up to me and say, uh, say, man, you got a crazy cousin. He just went in there and said bye to that white woman. And that's when, um, this man I was playing checker with, this older man, I guess he must have been around about 60 or 70. He jumped straight up and said, boy, say, y'all about to get out of here, say, that lady come out of that store and blow y'all brains off. Well, the, the, the sheriff came and told me they had found the body at Philip and wanted me to go and identify the body, which I did. And we found the body 
with, didn't have on any clothes at all. The body was so badly damaged that we couldn't hardly just tell who he was. But he happened to have on a ring with his initials, and that cleared it up. The body was shipped home, back north to Chicago, where Mamie Till Bradley insisted on an open casket funeral. So all the world can see, she said, what they did to my boy. showed Till's corpse, beaten, mutilated, shot through the head. A generation of black people would remember the horror of that photo. No, for tomorrow, I believe that the whole United States is mourning with me. And if the death of my son can mean something to the other unfortunate people all over the world, then for him to have died a hero would mean more to me than for him just to have died. Roy Bryant, husband of the woman in the store, and J.W. Milam, her brother-in-law, were arrested for the murder of Emmett Till. The trial was held in nearby Sumner, Mississippi. Black organizations like the NAACP and the black press were especially interested, and they worked hard to keep the case in the news, to make an example of Southern racism for the world. It was because it was a boy that they went there. They had to prove that they were superior. They had to prove it by taking away a 14-year-old boy. You know, it's in the virus, it's in the blood of the Mississippian. He can't help it. I'd like for the NAACP or any colored organization anywhere to know that we are here giving all parties a free trial and intend to give a fair and impartial trial. And we don't need the help of the NAACP, and we don't intend for them to help us. We never have any trouble until some of our southern niggas go up north, and the NAACP talks to them, and they come back home. I had covered the courts in many areas of this country, but the Till case, was unbelievable. I mean, I just didn't get the sense of being in a courtroom. It was, first place, segregated. The black press sat at a bridge table far off from the uh, court, and the boy's mother came down. They sat her there at the bridge table with us. Plus, the United States congressman at that time, Diggs, he came down, and I was the one that got him in because the sheriff wouldn't let him in. He said to the deputy that he called over, he said, this nigga here said there's a nigga outside who says that he's a congressman, <laughs> and he has corresponded with the judge, and the judge had told him to come on down, and uh, he would let him in, he said, but uh, the uh, sheriff won't let him in, so he's sending his card up there. So this guy said, a nigger congressman? And he said, 
That's what this nigga said. <laughs> so I said to myself, my God, I have never seen anything like this in my life. There was, uh, of course, a lot of buzzing uh, when I entered the, uh, the place and was placed in that uh, area. And uh, I think the judge said something about, uh, yeah, have that boy come on up here and sit down over here with these news reporters, you know. <laughs> What uh, do you intend to do here today? Uh... To answer any questions that might that the uh, attorneys might ask me to answer, to the how best. Do you think that, uh, how do you think you could possibly be a help to them? I don't know. I mean, just by answering whatever questions that they ask me. Uh, do you have any evidence bearing on this case? I do know that this is my son. The defense argued that the body found tied to the cotton gin fan in the river was so disfigured that it could not be identified as Emmett Till. The trial took five long, hot days. Because of threats to his life, the prosecution's star witness, Mose Wright, was kept hidden out of state. Will you go back to Mississippi to testify in the kidnap trial? Sure, sure, I'll go back because I promised the sheriff I'd be back in two. If I live, I'm going back to testify. And uh, after, after the trial, well, I'm through with Mississippi forever and ever. They didn't have my part in Mississippi. I'm through with it. I don't want nothing to happen. At the time, uh, I really didn't realize uh, how brave my grandfather Mose Wright was, you know. But uh, after I got older, I realized that he was a brave man. He was a mighty brave man to travel back down there you know, among all those hostile peoples and testify and get him up in court and point his finger at a white man and accuse him of murder. He was called upon to testify as to uh, could he see anybody in the courtroom, identify anybody in that courtroom that had come to his house that night and got the uh, uh, Emmett Till out. He stood up and there was a tension in the courtroom. And he says, in his broken language, Dar he. Dar he, there he is. Other black witnesses came forward too. <laughs> Their courage made no difference in Sumner, Mississippi. As the trial ended, a defense lawyer told the jury he was, quote, Sure, every last Anglo-Saxon one of you has the courage to free these men. It took the jury an hour to find the men not guilty. How do you folks feel now that it's all over? Roy, how about you? I'm just glad it's over with. J.W.? I am, too. Uh, Mrs. Bryant. Uh, I feel fine. How about you, Mrs. Milam? Fine. Did you expect this verdict? Well, I was hoping for it. Well, the whole trial was just a farce, and, but the verdict was, was the one that I had expected to be given. Months later, Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam told their story of the night of August 28th for $4,000 to reporter William Bradford Huey. Milam was startled at the belligerent attitude or the fact that young Till didn't appear to be afraid of him. Now, he'd gone and gotten him out of bed and had him in the back of a truck and young Till never realized the danger he was in. I'm quite sure that he never thought these two men would kill him. And, uh, or maybe he's just in such a strange environment, he doesn't, really just doesn't know what he's up against. And it seems to a rational mind today, it seems impossible that they could have killed him. But J.W. Milam looked up at me and said, well, when he told me about this white girl he had, he says, my friend, that's what this war is about down here now. He says, that's what we got to fight to protect. And he says, I just looked at him and I said, boy, you ain't gonna never see the sun come up again. For much of Southern history, lynching had been an ordinary story. 
Race killings were down by the 1950s, but over the years, there had been more than 500 documented lynchings in Mississippi alone. And the fact that uh, Emmett Till, a young black man, could be found floating down the river in Mississippi, as indeed many had been done over the years, uh, just set in concrete the determination of people to move forward. And I think uh, we said back there that uh, really only God, only the books in heaven can know how many Negroes have come up missing and dead and killed uh, under the system in which we lived. In Mississippi, a few black people stood up to the system, but it was not enough. Their challenge was easily beaten back. Three months later in Alabama, when many stood together, the challenge would be strong. 